welcome to this talk on adaptive traffic profiles as a tool to model heterogeneous systems in GEM5. Applications including autonomous driving combine the need for high performance with strict real-time requirements. The computer chips found in phones and laptops can provide that performance, but features like multi-core chips and caches come at a cost of decreased determinism and increased worst-case ex execution times. These costs are unacceptable in systems where a longer response time than expected could lead to a danger to life, such as in a self-driving car. Designing these systems is a complex problem and requires correspondingly complex tools and models in order to dimension them and verify that they can meet their requirements. In response to this need, ARM has released the AMBER Adaptive Traffic Profiles Framework as a specification and as an open source reference implementation. Here we present the use of ATP in combination with GEM5 and compared with a network calculus approach to model the effects of contention on DRAM memory. ATP profiles are a way of modeling the traffic, the flow of data around a system in a lightweight way. They can model complicated components in terms of their injection of data into a system without needing to accurately simulate, say, a GPU, which would be much more costly in terms of computing time. The ATP engine can be used standalone or, as demonstrated here, in combination with other simulators like GEM5. ATP profiles can be one of a number of different types. Master and slave profiles represent the devices within a system and can send or receive data. A master profile, such as the one on the right of this slide, makes read or write requests, whereas slave profiles respond. Delay and monitor profiles are fairly self-explanatory. Delays are there to provide fixed periods of nothing happening, and monitor profiles record events relating to other profiles. Highlighted on the right is the main component of a profile, the FIFO, a simple first-in, first-out buffer. The rate of a FIFO determines how quickly data is produced and put into the buffer for a write profile, or consumed from the buffer for a read. And in combination with the size or full level, it determines the latency tolerance, how long the delay to a response can be before the profile reports an underrun or an overrun. Other fields allow the user to limit the number of requests that can be in flight at any given time, or the total number of requests sent over the lifetime of the profile. The pattern field highlighted on the right is what defines the properties of the requests to be sent. The address can be a constant or can be incremented and the size is adjustable. The wait for field determines if the profile waits for a response or acknowledgement before proceeding. It's not shown here, but there can also be a wait for put in the main body of the profile descriptor, which would mean that the profile waits for a given event, such as another profile terminating, before starting to send requests. The DRAM controller is the entity that arbitrates access to DRAM chips. The controller maintains two queues, one for read requests, shown here in green, and one for write requests, shown in purple. Writes are considered non-critical from a timing perspective, hence reads are given priority. In fact, writes are only served if there are too many in the queue. This is called the watermark approach. The controller only switches to the write queue when the latter is above the watermark, and when it does so, it serves a batch of writes before returning to reads. The read queue is served according to a first ready, first come, first served policy. When the controller serves a request, it first moves all the data stored in a row into a buffer. This is time consuming. This means that any further requests use the data in the buffer, then they can be served much faster than if not. This is called a row hit. Row misses need to open the row before accessing any DRAM cells, so they take longer. Row hits are given prior priority under this policy, hence the first ready part of it. Row miss requests are simply scheduled first come, first served. Lastly, periodic DRAM refreshes occur to avoid loss of data. When they do, the controller takes a break and then re resumes serving reads and writes. The aim of our experiments was to compute the worst case delay that might be experienced by a read miss request that finds n minus one more read misses in the queue when it arrives at the memory controller. The resulting plot is a service curve for the read stream. A service curve is a mathematical construct that represents the worst case impulse response of a system to a batch of requests. Using them to model the DRAM controller allows the study of the worst case performance of composite systems involving DRAM memories. 
To obtain an upper bound on the delay, we need to construct a worst case scenario while taking into account some baseline assu assumptions. The maximum overtakes that a read miss can experience must be limited to end cap because otherwise the maximum delay would not be bounded at all. The, the arrival rate of the right queue must be known and bounded. If an infinite rate is allowed, the right queue will always be above the watermark, meaning that the controller will almost always be serving writes, only serving one read per batch of write requests. Under this scenario, it is fairly easy to compute a worst case delay, but the result is unrealistic and does not represent what happens in practice. When trying to devise a worst case scenario, the main point of uncertainty is where read hits should be placed. This is because the time cost of read hits increases as a function of their number, due to the interaction of the timing constraints on different sorts of DRAM accesses. Both of the timing diagrams on the right start with an activate, followed by a read miss. In the top one, there are two of these cycles shown in blue, where a read hit follows directly after the read miss. And in this case, the read hit falls within the time TRAS, which is the minimum delay allowed between an activate and a pre-charge. It should be noted that whether or not there is a read hit there, the pre-charge needed to start accessing the next row cannot happen before TRAS is finished. So the read hit doesn't actually add any delay to the next read miss being served. In the lower diagram, there are two read hits after the third re first read miss. And you can see that the second hit being there delays the next read miss by an extra time TRTP. This means that read hits should be placed back to back if at all possible, since this would maximise their cost. However, if the write rate is high, there may not be an interval of time that the controller can devote to serving reads which is long enough to accommodate all the read hits in a batch. When such an interval does not exist, there is no other option than to explore all the possibilities, leading to combinatory explosion. A set of ATP masters were used as the input to a DRAM memory controller modelled in Gem5. The controller had a small modification so that until the tagged request had been received, the controller would remain locked and not serve any requests. This meant that the two profiles highlighted here, the interfering read source and the pre-fill write source, could fill the read and write queues without any packets being immediately served. Once the queues had been set up, the tagged request was issued, allowing the controller to start serving requests. After the tagged request is sent, the other two highlighted profiles also start. The read hit source provides end cap hits that overtake the tagged read, and the second write source issues packets with a rate that can be varied. At higher rates, the write buffer would go over the watermark and trigger switching to serving writes several times before the tagged read could be served. The controller was also modified to trigger a refresh cycle once all the read hits had been served, as the worst case delay should include the assumption of at least one refresh. In order to find the worst case delay, one may describe the controller as a finite state machine. In the latter, nodes are the possible states, for example, serving a read hit, and arcs are the transitions between states with an associated time cost. Then the worst case delay for the nth read miss is the longest path that leads to visiting a read miss state n times. <clears throat> However, this is more easily said than done, and the number of paths faces combinatory explosion as n increases. Therefore, finding the worst case delay is something to be done using optimization solvers, assuming it is doable at all performance wise. Luckily for us, it turns out that providing both lower and upper bounds on the worst case delay is a much easier task. What's more, these bounds are often quite close. This makes the upper bound a cheap, good substitute for the worst case delay. Looking at the service curve, both methods show the batches of writes having an increasing impact as the write arrival rate increases. Comparing the results from the two methods, it's clear that the distance between them increases with increased write contention. This could be a result of pessimism in the network calculus approach having more of an impact, or of the Gem5 model being less able to capture the worst case performance. Comparing the service curves for different types of memory shows similar results for the DDR3 and DDR4 memory types, although DDR4 shows slightly worse worst case times. This reflects that the trade-offs made to improve memory density and bandwidth in the DDR4, hence improving the average performance, can come at the cost of reduced worst case performance. The LPDDR4 memory that was tested has significantly longer delays, largely due to its packaging requests differently. 
The same write bit rate as in the other two memory types results in twice the request rate, and most of the time costs come per packet rather than per bit.